Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Hi, this is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. And this week, coming to us from beautiful Santa Monica, California, and originally from the greater D.C. area, is Mr. Sean O'Grady, a.k.a. Shawnee Cameras. Uh, as I said, he was born and raised in the D.C. area, but he cut his teeth in photography, videography, and production, filming in clubs, venues, and sets all around the United States. He's worked with many Grammy Award-winning musicians, and he's currently a freelancing producer-director living either in Santa Monica, as I mentioned, or out of a suitcase in a town near you. The reason I had him on is I actually put out my feeler alerts for somebody who had formerly been an alcoholic and would call themselves that and is now not one. So I do want to get into what he thinks happens when you die and how that may or may not relate to addiction and substances and all that but let's start out with the actual like more important stuff in life which is uh sean you're a happy man how are you doing and why are you so happy wow so i'll just start with this the the one thing that i had to learn getting very quickly into the podcast and recovery and sobriety is is that happiness is not a destination it's a state of mind and that is something that took me 35 years to really wrap my head around so in the present moment, I am happy, but that happiness is predicated on a phone call, a text message, um, you know, ha- what happens next after our conversation. So at this moment, I'm happy because I'm being valued for the contribution and the insight that hopefully I can provide to you and your listeners. So that's hopefully going to w- answer your question. That actually really does. And so happiness has always been a state of mind and not a destination, but it sounds based on your answer that it used to be a destination. Can you kind of describe the side of that mentality? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't know why, man. I, you know, I've always thought as a kid, I think probably a lot of kids think this. I don't know if it's, you know, just predestined for, you know, people suffering from addiction or alcoholism or dual diagnosis with psychiatric issues. But, you know, I, when I was a kid, I always looked, even though my parents weren't that great of an example, but looking at older adults and thinking like, oh, yeah, once I just like, you know, get this far in my career, like, I'll be fine. Once I hit this age, everything is fine. And then I realized that, like, I don't know what at what age that we're all like literally ducks on a pond where everybody's like, you know, most of us are calm on the surface, but paddling like fucking frantically beneath it. And everybody's figuring it out for the first time. And and everybody like nothing is guaranteed and nothing is safe and and nothing is you know, further from the truth that you get to a point in life and everything is just like, oh yeah, it's cool. It's just, co- it's like coast. You meet those people and it just like befuddles you because I feel like they like see through the matrix. It's like, how do you bend time? Like Neo. And um, I just, I, I don't know. That was like always like this, this mystification that kind of enveloped me from a very, very young age. And, you know, when that the veil dropped, it was kind of like a really weird, like, realization um helpful obviously to not live in a fantasy world but it it just um yeah i don't know it just kind of blindsided me that we're all really just kind of figuring this out and you know, our parents are fallible you know that all kind of plays a part of it too I, I also don't know what age i was when i realized that our parents are just you know were us but you know half of us you know at that age you know at 13 they were afraid of whatever i was afraid of probably and at 22 they were probably looking for the same kind of career insight that I was looking at, you know, we were, I just looked at them like kind of like God, like messianic figures. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's because I like fantasy and I like, you know, drama and medieval goblins and game of Thrones type. Maybe that's because I just wanted to mystify everything and put a great big mystery on it. You know, maybe that's my Catholic upbringing too. I, I don't know, you know, but that's, <laughs> I feel like I start, I start, I started behind zero, you know, and now I'm like just catching up to past zero. Well, that's, I know. I mean, that was a great answer and it really gels well with me. And I think just for the purpose of our conversation, since you don't know me that well, and also for our audience, you know, I've never been so addicted to an illegal substance that I had to check into counseling or do something about it, but I have been addicted uh, horribly so to cigarettes. And then I've uh, felt addicted to substances that are illegal, but I never, like I said, got to like this point where I had to get someone else's help to stop doing them. So I'm very familiar with addiction is what I'm trying to say. And I, and I respect it, you know, if that makes sense, meaning like it's a, it's a beast and it's a weird beast. And it like 
convinces you that you're wrong when you think you're right and vice versa. And it just kind of does whatever it takes for me, at least to get me to like buy another pack of cigarettes, give up a 21 day streak and all that. So I'm curious, like, were you at the age of eight, you were getting drunk like Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers? Yeah, clearly. <laughs> uh, well, so there's like a lot of ways to kind of answer that question. Like I'm a recovering cigarette smoker too. Like, you know, I hit my buddy's vape yesterday because everybody out here vapes, you know, it's just like it's ridiculous. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to answer this. So, like, you know, in the program, they're like, well, what, when did you have your first drink? Dude, I was probably, like, three years old, you know, because not like Anthony Kiedis, but, like, I am part of that generation. Like, you were – our grandparents and parents would, like, you know, put whiskey or wine in your gums if you were – you wouldn't shut the f*** up at night. <laughs> you know, like, that was a thing. That's parenting. That's 1980s-style parenting. So technically I had my first drink then. And then I remember being like at my father's house because my parents split. I'd be at his house and he'd be like, oh, try a Heineken. Just take a sip, you know, take a sip of this pina colada I made. Or I'd be at my grandmother's house. Take a sip of this red wine or this Grand Marnier. Don't get drunk, but like respect it. Like, you know, have a sip. So, you know, it was always around at a very, very, very young age. Um, I think then what you asked, like what kind of takes it from like that to like asking for help is was, was, am i correct when i remember that yeah yeah definitely so you know i mean i'm just really grateful i got to the point that i could ask for help and receive it because it's not something that i mean you i don't think you can do on your own you know what i mean like this is not like a single person's journey that's why there's a group that's why there's it's called the fellowship this is literally just a group of men and women that have that suffer a common affliction and they need the support of a group to help get the answers to live day by day in an ever-changing world, in an ever-changing of their world, you know? Like I said, in this moment right now, like, I am, I'm happy enough. I'm dealing with a lot of f- but the way that I can reframe it, like, we all are. I mean, I know you are, I know I am. I'm not special. <laughs> and right in the program, we call it terminally unique. You know, I'm not terminally unique. <laughs> I'm just a guy, a speck of dust on a giant rock. But... To me, they feel like, you know, crazy, wild, you know, weird problems. So at this moment, I'm trying to reframe it into happiness where, like, these are good problems. Because these are not problems I had two years ago. They're growth problems. And I'm trying to, and I'm trying to like, restructure my brain into thinking that as challenges rather than, like, fearsome technicalities. And that's what the kind of the group is. It's really helping you kind of just deal with life on life's terms, as we say, and one day at a time. These are just kind of things because we... We grew up in a culture of fear, whether it's, you know, put on by our parents or the outside world or trauma, generational trauma or, you know, or just something that's inherently born within us. You know, I don't know. I, I like you. So when I qualify, you know, you said at, a, at, a, at an age, you, you weren't really addicted to anything except for maybe like smoking and you felt the pull, but never like, you know, to really take you over the edge. I remember as, as a young kid. I was extremely overweight as a young kid. So I already had not only a predilection to sugar and eating and food and the reward system associated with that, but I also had a very low self-worth of myself because how I was perceived or how I thought I was perceived by my peers, mainly young women. And that lack of validation was crushing to me. It was crushing to my ego. It still crushes me at 40 years old who's lost 140 pounds and feels and looks better than he's ever felt and looked in his entire life. So for me, that seed of addiction, that seed of there's something wrong that needs to be appeased with an outside force, I, I eat sugar, porn, marijuana, Coke, narcos, whatever. There was already something, a gap that needed to be filled. And when I came to an age where I found those remedies And it started slowly. It started with food and then it went to sugar and then it went to, you know, extreme interest in the opposite sex. And then it came to alcohol and weed. And then it just went down the the rabbit hole from there. So it starts, it can start at a young age, but, you know, sometimes the flip doesn't get switched until later. And if you are pre-diagnosed with, you know, psychiatric issues, I've already, you know, suffered from depression from a young age because of some of the things I've mentioned, whether it be my parents' divorce or, you know, it being extremely overweight and feeling different than everybody else being laughed at, you know, it, it could do a lot to a kid. And if you have a dual diagnosis in that respect, I mean, you're, you're suffering a lot more challenging battle than somebody that just, you know, drinks too much or, you know, does shoots heroin or I don't know, 
I don't, I don't know their journey. No, no, these are good examples. And uh, I mean, you touched on so many things I would like to open up. I too was overweight. I lost a lot of weight and, and felt bad about it, but I still have low self-esteem. You know, I'm 41 and I'm, I'm definitely like at a state where I know that happiness is not a destination. I'm very aware of what we already started this interview with. So it's not that I'm like on this precipice of like, oh no, what am I going to do? But I still know that like, when I have a bad day, I like want to open a, a beer or have a drink and like, and I know that's not healthy or I want to like smoke more pot than normal. And you know, just like things like that, or especially the big one is like, I get in a huge fight with my wife and I'm like, just in my head, I'm like, all I can think is like, go to the store, buy a pack of cigarettes and smoke those, like smoke them down, you know? And mm. So, uh, I am curious because I did once go to an AA because somebody, uh, I was going through my divorce. Somebody who had done AA was like, you should go to AA just to like hear other people and see, like get perspective on what you consider our problems and not. And it was the least helpful, least uplifting experience of my life. And I, I know you're not supposed to talk about it. So I'm being like careful, but uh, no one in there gelled with me. I thought everyone was weird. And I thought if anything, <laughs> it was almost like bordering on like a hookup place. Like, like girls were like making weird eye contact. And, like, so I'm just curious, like, do you find your group? Like, like do when you moved across the country, you're like, oh no, now I don't have like my peeps from that AA. Or do you find like any city you're in, you go to a meeting and it's all fine. So yeah, dude, there's a lot to kind of like unpack in that. There's, here's a few problems with quote unquote branding when it comes to the program. First of all, you know, I hear this a lot. People walk in and they see God written on the wall, or it's like, you know, in a basement of a church, like to, to tr a lot of people that have strayed from our path, like I'm a recovering Catholic, right? So it's like, we have a problem with a authority and B spirituality. But the program is not religion based just because the word god is in it doesn't mean it's religion based so just because god's written on the wall doesn't mean that we're talking about catholicism you have to believe in jesus christ as your lord and savior or like you have to have judaic principles and we unpack that in the steps and that's i'm not going to dispel that but like you go through it if you need to and you'll figure it out bottom line is we welcome everybody it doesn't even matter there are kids that go there that smoke too much pot and, you know, and that just leads them into an alcoholic state, i.e. a compulsive state. It's all this. That's why there's Overeaters Anonymous. That's why there's, that's why there's sex anonymous law. It's, be, it's people that have things that they do things alcoholically, i.e. compulsively, that they need help because it's ruling them. It's an obsession of the mind and it's harboring them from living a normal, healthy life or having normal, healthy relationships with those around them. So back to the whole situation. You have to kiss more frogs to meet your prince. Uh, just because you go to one group doesn't mean that group reflects the entirety of the situation. You're going to meet some nut bars. And someone very wise told me, they're like, look, you know you haven't been in A long enough if you like everybody that you meet in A. <laughs> so the great thing is, it's like there's perfect things for, for different people, right? Like there's people go to a meeting. And then they don't like that meeting or they don't like five people in that meeting. So they start their own meeting and then more people come to that meeting. That starts a new meeting. It's an offshoot of this meeting. I go to a meeting on the beach, nine 15 on Sunday mornings. That's an offshoot of a New York group. And it's a hundred people, guys and girls, children, because you know, they got to, you know, there's no babysitters. They got to bring their kids, their dogs. Everybody sits in a <laughs> massive circle. And it's a 20 minute speaker meeting with birthdays and celebration. Birthdays are, you know, for one year sobriety, one month, one day, three, six, nine, whatever. And it's an hour meeting and it's absolutely fire. It's the only mixed meeting I go to because there, since we are alcoholics and we probably suffer from more than one problem, i.e. we have Al-Anon, we're children of alcoholics, ACOAs, adult children of alcoholics. A reflective group conscious is go to a men's stag and find a men's sponsor if you're a man. Because then that removal of, you know, maybe sexual flirtation or any, just anything to flip our crazy brains is kind of removed. So it's like, we can focus on the work. We can focus on what dudes are going through day in and day out. So my home group is a bunch of men and we are solution based and we are action based. And it took me many frogs to kiss before I found that. Because I got sober in Southern California because, like you just said, I couldn't get sober with people in Washington, D.C. or Montgomery County. Are you serious? What do you think I had in common as a 35-year-old, 300-pound, overweight, struggling artist in the entertainment industry versus a stay-at-home mom that was drinking white Zinfandel, popping 
Percocets and bitching about her friends at Columbia Country Club. What in the f do you think I had in common with them at that point in my life? At that point in my life. But now, but now, over five years sober, been around the United States, been to a bunch of meetings, heard of different stories, been to a bunch of groups. Now, instead of looking at the differences with each other, I see the commonalities. We all suffer from the similar affliction. And even though, dude, there's a guy in my group who went to rehab in a Bentley, his Bentley. You know what I'm saying? He's like a super, super famous artist. And I love his shares because they are <laughs> always fire. And But they're, they're also like crazy. Like I can't, I cannot relate to you in your hideaway in Venice <laughs> for the next three weeks. And you're mad because something <laughs> didn't go your way, you know, at like the winery. Tour. Like, I just, I can't relate to you, my friend. But I love your, what you're sharing about soberly. And that's my point. So you got to kiss a lot of different frogs before finding the right group. And just because you show up to one meeting doesn't mean they're all like that. And I was grateful enough to find this right group after, like when I was in rehab, they forced us to go to meetings, which they should, you need to. But through the culture that I was going to in Orange County was toxic. And it was like you said, it's a lot of like dudes trying to hook up with chicks, um, people that are there for body brokering, which is basically exchanging one patient for, to a recovery center for another for a fee. Whoa. Dude, if you told me about that when I was 25, I would have jumped on that. We all would have. <laughs> Yeah, dude. I got body brokered into rehab. That's crazy. And we tried to do like a documentary on it and then Vice got involved. Oh, wow. Bottom line is it was toxic and I was jaded from the program and I didn't work a program for a good year plus. And then when I moved out of Orange County, actually I was kicked out of Orange County and went to Los Angeles. Then six months later, I found my home group, luckily, from a kid I used to go to rehab with. So it's full circle. So yeah, a lot of frogs to kiss before you find your friends. I have like uh, three quick questions. Are you willing to slash do you date women who are still drinking or is that like just off limits too hard? You're hilarious. It's like you <laughs> like women in Los Angeles want to date me to begin with. That's really cute. <laughs> this place is an absolute sexual desert, dude. It's just I, like, oh man, it's, it's so terrible. <laughs> It's so terrible. Just be grateful you're, you're married, dude. <laughs> and I know the grass is always greener and whatever, but dude, just be grateful. You don't have to deal with these animals out here. I, dude, I got chatted up by three different Chinese bots over the weekend because I'm so dumb. So all jokes aside, it's, I, we talk about this a lot. And my ex that uh, I was dating, God bless her, we're, we're still really good friends. I mean, she didn't really drink to begin with. She had, she had some, some issues that kind of prohibited her from drinking. She wasn't an alcoholic. Um, she was gluten free and she, there were things in like, she didn't drink hard liquor and barely drank, you know, cider. So like, it was really never an issue with us. Um, it what you know, we'd go out and have Coca Cola's and a lot of guys, we, you know, have normies, you know, wives that are normies. I mean, I have family members whose wives and girlfriends are normies, you know, they, they still drink and it's, I, I don't go out and search for one or the other. But no, I, I, it's, it's, it's whatever I think the spirit of the universe puts in your path. And um, I think there's pros and cons to having both, to be honest. That segues into the second part of the same question. So I said at the beginning that you're a friend of a friend's friend. So like one of my best friends on earth, he was a guest on the show, Mark Borger. How hard is it to go home and like hang out with like other people who still drink that you used to get drunk with? Because that's like different than just like new people to me. Dude, 100%. It's, it's crazy. It's like, to be really honest, man, I feel really blessed. Like, to be, I am able to do literally everything that I was able to do, except for drink or do drugs. Everything else I do, man, I go to like parties, I go to concerts, I go to raves. You know what I mean? Like, I, my, my roommate, you know, it's Southern California. Like, he smokes weed, he has cocktails, and God bless him. I mean, he can, you know, he can take care of himself, you know, and show up to work at, at four in the morning and work a 12 hour day, five days a week. That's what he does. You're very relatable, like, on every level. And I know, like, I've gone to parties and not drink. And I know, like, I, I drink on average once a week. I used to be a bartender. But anyway, I want to keep this focus on you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pivot. This show is called Coffin Talk. And we ask every single guest, no matter what, what they think happens when you die. Just to make sure it's framed correctly. Not what do you think happens to other people when they die. What do you think will actually happen to you and your conscious experience when you die? Oh, man. I've been thinking about this since I was, like, five years old, dude. So I have, like, two answers as part of the same answer. I saw a stud I saw a study. I think I think it was in the, the DMT um, documentary that's on Netflix a few years ago. And basically, you know, 
I'm going to butcher this and you might want to fact check this and edit this around a little bit, but so basically, you know, when you, when you die, like the same chemicals that constitute DMT is what gets released in your brain and that euphoria, that, um, that hallucination or whatever is what you're supposed to experience when you die. And, you know, 15 minutes feels like 15 hours or whatever. So if that's released when you die, then you're essentially living forever if all of it is released at once. So I don't know, like, you're obviously not going to be conscious, but if it's a split second and all of it gets released at once, like, wouldn't that then be forever, right? Or, like, a very, very long time. So, and that would be your definition of heaven. That would be your euphoria that that's where you would see all your, you know, friends and your family and your dog and, and, you know, all the the things that you love. I think about that a lot. And, um, I've been rewatching actually black mirror with my roommate and there's that one episode, uh, San Junipero. And it's a very similar concept where like, you know, when people are put out to pasture, they take them to a place where they're living in this, like, uh, basically like suspended consciousness and their 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 brains are pumped with these images of their their past, their loved ones, and they get to live through those memories forever. So I I think it, it's some sort of combination of the two, where like you are released, and this chemical gets released out of your brain, and then you're blissfully able to live that you know unconscious conscious heaven until I mean I don't know like do you ever like not are you ever not cognizant of it? Like, are you ever cognizant of it? Anyway, that's what I, that's what I think that happens. Like, you know, I, I wish there was some big guy in the sky that opens the gates and, and it's all there. I think it's all metaphor. You know, I think there's probably truth to all of it, to, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I believe in spirits. I believe in angels and in some sort of respects and, you know, and things like that, demons and all that, you know, but I don't think they're like how the media portrays it. Yeah. Uh, that was a great answer. It was truly profound. And I'm more or less actually in the same camp. And since you brought up DMT, because I've done ayahuasca a few times, I- I'm curious, I don't personally group cocaine and heroin and a lot of other drugs with like DMT specifically, and to a lesser extent, mushrooms and LSD. And I say to a lesser extent, because you can kind of abuse those for fun. So I put them in a little bit, but, but like DMT is like, non-abusive meaning like you can't do it like 700 times in a row and like you know there's a lot of other issues with it so i'm i am curious would you still be open to like that sort of experience like flying to peru and doing ayahuasca or does that not even interest you remotely it's actually truly funny you say that so there's what we affectionately call california sober (laughs) and i'm sure you can kind of guess what that means there's a, there's a lot of young men and women that you know they might you know used to bang heroin and meth and you know it truck stop bathrooms but they've kicked that addiction and you know smoke pot or microdose mushrooms and then go hike griffith park there is very much that in the community and i don't i don't frown down upon those people all that sounds amazing that you're able to do that with your life i can't there are also people in this in the sober community that do go to mexico and do toad ceremonies and there are ones that go to you know especially peru and do ayahuasca ceremonies and you know there's rich hippies in the hills that do it out here too you know i it it is something that happens i don't think it breaks your sobriety to be honest a lot of us like i said we suffer from dual diagnosis or ptsd or uh, undiagnosed things of trauma that need to be unlocked and emdr isn't effective enough or you know regular therapy with the same therapist for 10 years isn't effective enough and doing the steps nine different times with your sponsor isn't effective enough and there's just a key that needs to be unlocked. And maybe ayahuasca is that key. So to answer your question, yeah, I'm 1000% open to it. I really am. And I don't think I'm there yet. I think I, I, you know, I guess it's now I'm putting a destination on it. I feel like I need a little bit more time just with myself. Cause I'm still, I'm still like, you know, sobriety looks different today than it did yesterday or like even, you know, a month ago or a year ago. So I, and we have a, also have a saying called time is not a tool. But I also feel like it is important to accrue those days and have those experiences. You know, I call it like karmic equity to draw upon on the tough days or on days that you can't make it to meetings or connect with a guy or a girl like in the fellowship. And I feel like the more days that I'm able to stack 
in that respect will kind of help me uh, if this is something that I do decide to do um, in my journey. So I am, a, I am, de I'm definitely open to it. I really, really am. I, Cause I think that there are things that are holding me back, whether it be, you know, professionally or psychologically or romantically that no matter how much therapy or meditation I do, it just, it's like a smell that won't come off. And maybe that's, maybe that's the, the, you know, the thing that'll help unlock it. I don't know. I'm just looking for answers. I can tell you based on everyone I've ever talked to who did it and also my own experiences, you are like candidate 1A for it and in a good way, like in a very complimentary way. Um, you have to be like curious enough and not afraid enough. And uh, the two, if you have any sort of imbalance between the two, I, I you're not going to regret doing it, but you're not going to like get the most out of it. And also I would just say, see a traditional therapist if you have either of those issues. And also I, I heard a stat the other day that it takes 10 years to find actually like the right therapist. I, um, I have two therapists and I have a sponsor and then I have the group. My old roommate is a young woman. She's like in her forties. She's got over 20 years sobriety and I see her professionally. And she also does breath work, which is a form of meditation. You may have heard like Wim Hof talk about, but, um, so I will do that with her and I do feel better. She does know me. She knows my story. She's also ACOA and um you know we have a lot of relatable qualities because we did live together you know for two years and then we knew each other like for 10 years prior to that or you know eight years prior to that so and we're both part of the program so i recommend i suggest you know you all do what you want i suggest a dual track system you know get a sponsor in a home group get a therapist you know talk to your program friends if you have a problem and then talk to your normal friends because your program friends will only see things through one lens. And that's, you know, what the book says or what the group says. And like, it's a very spiritual, Oh, we must be honest with everybody. And we must do this. Well, try being honest in the entertainment industry in 2022 in Los Angeles and see how far that gets you. So sometimes you got to <laughs> talk to your friends that work in the industry and you got to get cutthroat and you got to do this, this, and this. And I know it goes against everything you learn in the room, Sean, but just stick with me, kid. You'll be all right. You know? So you got to get all the answers. And then you have to run them through a filter and then you have to figure it out by yourself. And that's, you know, that's what I've been learning. Like all this stuff that I feel like, you know, like, yeah, Sean, this is how cognitive thinking works. It's like, well, I missed that. I missed that memo when I was a kid. I'm sorry. And we all miss that memo. And that's like what it is to be like an alcoholic. It's like we learn stuff whenever we get sober and stay sober that we feel the rest of the world was just kind of like inherently given at a very young age. We just missed that, missed the class that day. I don't know. You've said so many wonderful things, and I think this is going to be a really helpful episode for everyone, just like people who do or do not have substance abuse, because if you don't have it, it's interesting to hear what it's like from someone. And then if you have a family member or someone who's suffering, you can hear hope and a lot of like solutions from your story. And then if you're wondering if you have a problem, well, assess it and be honest about it. So I'm, I'm really thankful to you, and I'm happy with all of your answers, but I, I do love to just kind of give a free open floor. So uh, you have the floor, and we'll wrap it up. Cool, man. All right, thank you. And grateful to be here. And just, you know, we love to hear ourselves talk. So this is a great place to do that. Um, as my friend David Kay would say, this is uh, time for a one minute banger. So no one can really diagnose you as an addict or an alcoholic unless you do. Okay. Everybody can point the finger. It could walk like a duck. It could talk like a duck. But at the end of the day, is only you can really say if you're a duck. So know that nobody is judging you. We, everybody is welcome. And if you are doing something that is compulsive, i.e. alcoholic, that's just, that's just the, the synonym, then, you know, come and check it out, dude. And just know that it's not a cult. I don't want your money. You know, we don't, we're not going to make you jump through any crazy hoops. But there are things that, you know, are highly suggested that you do to help you stay sober one day at a time. And a lot of us, you know, we came to like maybe shut up the court system or maybe shut up our wives or girlfriends or husbands or boyfriends or whatever you identify as. And, but we, we would do that, but then we, we stayed to get sober. We stayed to stop drinking or doing whatever it is we were doing. And the craziest thing is that is just the surface. We have a saying called more will be revealed and, and you go to stop drinking. But we stay to learn how to deal with life on life's terms, how life changes, how people make you angry. How do you deal with that cognitively? How do you deal with that rationally? And that taught me a lot of patience, a lot of pause. And just I, I really think I'm a better human. I know I'm a better human because of it. I'm a better brother. 
I'm a better uncle. I'm a better cousin, man. Like I'm proud of myself. I like who I look in, you know, when I look in the mirror, like, you know, what I see back for, it took me 35 years. So at the beach meeting, I, I went yesterday to the beach meeting with my sponsee brother. We both have the same sponsor. He lives on the West side. He's a super rad guy. And we go to shows together and all that. So we go to this meeting. He put me onto it. I take my beach cruiser down there, very California, you know, and go sit on the beach with dogs running around at 915 on a Sunday morning. If you asked me five years ago, if I would be living in Santa Monica, hanging out with a bunch of drunks, their dogs and their kids at 915, not loaded from the night before on a beach in Southern California, listening to a 15 year old girl talk about her sobriety journey. She just celebrated one year, said she started getting up at like six. Like you, if you told me that would be my story, I would have laughed at your face. So I'm just saying, dude, it's, it could be a long life with a lot of crazy possibilities. And you'll meet some amazing people along the way. Just be open for the experience. Don't be closed minded and don't believe all the hype in the media because it, you really got to go for yourself. Kiss a lot of frogs and figure out which one is the true prince. That was a great answer. Thank you again for gracing us with your presence and your wisdom. And for everyone listening at home, my name is Mike Oppenheim. You have been listening to Cough and Talk. The best way to support the show is to head over to MikeyOp.com, M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com, and sign up for free for the little newsletter that comes out once a week. And if you want to support us even more than that, sign up for the premium subscription. Either way, we love you, and we will see you soon.